continuing the murders in the Rue Morgue. I do not know it, said Dupin. I am not sure of it. Here, however, is a small piece of ribbon, which, from its form and from its greasy appearance, has evidently been used in tying the hair in one of those long queues of which sailors are so fond. Moreover, this knot is one which few besides sailors can tie, and is peculiar to the Maltese. I picked the ribbon up at the foot of the lightning rod. It could not have belonged to either of the deceased. Now if, after all, I am wrong in my induction from this ribbon, that the Frenchman was a sailor belonging to a Maltese vessel, still I can have done no harm in saying what I did in the advertisement. If I am in error, he will merely suppose that I have been misled by some circumstance into which he will not take the trouble to inquire. But if I am right, a great point is gained. Cognizant, although innocent of the murder, the Frenchman will naturally hesitate about replying to the advertisement, about demanding the orangutan. He will reason thus, I am innocent, I am poor, my orangutan is of great value to one in my circumstances, a fortune of itself. Why should I lose it through idle apprehensions of danger? Here it is within my grasp. It was found in the Bois de Boulogne at a vast distance from the scene of that butchery. How can it ever be suspected that a brute beast should have done the deed? The police are at fault. They have failed to procure the slightest clue. Should they even trace the animal, it would be impossible to prove me cognizant of the murder, or to implicate me in guilt on account of that cognizance. Above all, I am known. The advertiser designates me as the possessor of the beast. I am not sure to what limits his knowledge may extend. Should I avoid claiming a property of so great value, which it is known that I possess, I will render the animal at least liable to suspicion. It is not my policy to attract attention, either to myself or to the beast. I will answer the advertisement. Get the ring up to and keep it close until this matter has blown over. At the moment, we heard a step upon the stairs. Be ready, said Dupin, with your pistols, but neither use them nor show them until at a signal from myself. The front door of the house has been left open, and the visitor had entered without ringing, and advanced several steps upon the staircase. Now, however, he seemed to hesitate. Presently we heard him descending. Dupin was moving quickly to the door. When we heard him coming up, he did not turn back a second time, but stepped up with the decision and rapped at the door of our chamber. Come in, said Dupin, in a cheerful and hearty tone. A man entered. He was a sailor, evidently a tall, stout, a muscular-looking person, with a certain daredevil expression of countenance, not altogether unprepossessing. His face, greatly sunburnt, was more than half hidden by whisker and mustachio. He had with him a huge oaken cudgel, but appeared to be otherwise unarmed. He bowed awkwardly and bade us good evening, in French accents, which, although somewhat chattelish, were still sufficiently indicative of a Parisian origin. Sit down, my friend, said Dupin. I suppose you have called about the Ring Otang. Upon my word, I almost envy you the possession of him, a remarkable, fine, and no doubt a very valuable animal. How old do you suppose him to be? The sailor drew a long breath with the air of a man relieved of some intolerable burden, and then replied with an assured tone, I have no way of telling, 
but he can be more than four. He can't be more than four or five years old. Have you got him here? Oh no, we had no conveniences for keeping him here. He is at a livery stable in the Rue de Borg, just by. You can get him in the morning, of course. You are prepared to identify the property. To be sure I am, sir. I shall be sorry to part with him, said Dupin. I don't mean you should be at all this trouble for nothing, sir, said the man. Couldn't expect it. I am very willing to pay a reward for the finding of the animal. That is to say, anything in reason. Well, replied my friend, that is all very fair to be sure. Let me think. What should I have? Oh, I will tell you. My reward shall be this. You shall give me all the information in your power about these murders in the Rue Morgue. Dupin said the last words in a very low tone, and very quietly. Just as quietly, too, he walked toward the door, locked it, and put the key in his pocket. He then drew a pistol from his bosom and placed it without the least flurry upon the table. The sailor's face flushed up as if he were struggling with suffocation. He startled to his feet and grasped his cudgel, but the next moment he fell back into his seat, trembling violently, and with the countenance of death itself he spoke not a word. I pitied him from the bottom of my heart. My friend, said Dupin in a kind tone, you are alarming yourself unnecessarily. You are indeed. We mean you no harm, whatever. I pledge you the honor of a gentleman and of a Frenchman, that we intend you no injury. I perfectly well know that you are innocent of the atrocities in the Rue Morgue. It will not do, however, to deny that you are in some measure implicated in them. From what I've already said, you must know that I have had no means... Uh, you must know that I have had means of information about this matter, means of which you could never have dreamed. Now, the thing stands thus. You have done nothing which you could have avoided. Nothing, certainly, which renders you culpable. You were not even guilty of robbery, when you might have robbed with impunity. You have nothing to conceal. You have no reason for concealment. On the other hand, you are bound by every principle of honor to confess all you know. An innocent man is now imprisoned, charged with that crime of which you could point out the perpetrator. The sailor had recovered his presence of mind, in a great measure, while Dubin uttered these words, but his original boldness of bearing was all gone. So help me God, said he, after a brief pause, I will tell you all I know about this affair, but I do not expect you to believe one half I say. I would be a fool indeed if I did. Still I am innocent, and I will make a clean breast if I die for it. What he stated was, in substance this, he had lately made a voyage to the Indian archipelago, a party of which he formed one, landed at Borneo, and passed into the interior on an excursion a pleasure. Himself and a companion had captured the ring Ateng. This companion, dying, the animal fell into his own exclusive possession. After great trouble occasioned by the intractable ferocity of his captive during the home voyage, he at length succeeded in lodging it safely at his own residence in Paris, were not to attract toward himself the unpleasant curiosity of his neighbors. He kept it carefully secluded until such time as it should be recovered from a wound in the foot received from a splinter on board ship. His ultimate design was to sell it. Returning home from some sailor's frolic on the night, or rather in the morning of the murder, he found the beast occupying his own bedroom, into which it had broken from a closet adjoining, where it had been, as was thought securely confined, razor in hand, and fully lathered. It was sitting before a looking glass, attempting the operation of shaving, in which it had no doubt previously watched its master through the keyhole of the closet. Terrified at the sight of so dangerous a weapon in the possession of an animal so ferocious and so well able to use it, the man for some moments was at a loss what to do. He had been accustomed, however, to quiet the creature, even in its fiercest moods, by the use of a whip, 
and to this he now resorted. Upon sight of it, the orang obtained sprang at once through the door of the chamber, down the stairs, and thence through a window, unfortunately open into the street. The Frenchman followed in despair, the ape, razor still in hand, occasionally stopping to look back and gesticulate at its pursuer until the latter had nearly come up with it and then again made off. In this manner, the chase continued for a long time. The streets were profoundly quiet as it was nearly three o'clock in the morning. In passing down an alley in the rear of the Rue Morgue, the fugitive's attention was arrested by a light gleaming from the open window of Madame la Espanay's chamber in the fourth story of her house. Rushing to the building, it perceived the lightning rod, clambered up with inconceivable agility, grasped the shutter, which was thrown back fully against the wall, and by its means swung itself directly upon the headboard of the bed. The whole feat did not occupy a minute. The shutter was kicked open again by the orangutan as it entered the room. The sailor, in the meantime, was both rejoiced and perplexed. He had strong hopes of now recapturing the brute, as it could scarcely escape from the trap into which it had ventured, except by the rod, where it might be intercepted as it came down. On the other hand, there was much cause for anxiety as to what it might do in the house. The latter reflection urged the band still to follow the fugitive. A lightning rod is ascended without difficulty, especially by a sailor. But when he had arrived as high as the window, which lay far to his left, his career was stopped. The most that he could accomplish was to reach over so as to obtain a glimpse of the interior of the room. At this glimpse, he nearly fell from his hold through excess of horror. Now, it was that those hideous shrieks arose upon the night, which had startled from slumber the inmates of the Rue Morgue, Madame la Espanay and her daughter, habited in their night clothes, had apparently been arranging some papers in the iron chest already mentioned, which had been wheeled into the middle of the room. It was open, and its contents lay beside it on the floor. The victims must have been sitting with their backs towards the window, and from the time elapsing between the ingress of the beast and the screams, it seems probable that it was not immediately perceived. The flapping to of the shutter would naturally have been attributed to the wind. As the sailor looked in, the gigantic animal had seized Madame la Espanay by the hair, which was loose, as she had been combing it, and was flourishing the razor about her face, in imitation of the motions of a barber. The daughter lay prostrate and motionless. She had swooned. The screams and struggles of the old lady, during which the hair was torn from her head, had the effect of changing the probably specific purposes of the orangutan into those of wrath. With one determined sweep of its muscular arm, it nearly severed her hair from her body. It nearly severed her head from her body. The sight of blood inflamed its anger into a frenzy. Gnashing its teeth and flashing fire from its eyes, it flew upon the body of the girl and embedded its fearful talons in her throat retaining its grasp until she expired. Its wandering and wild glances fell at this moment upon the head of the bed, over which the face of its master, rigid with horror, was just discernible. The fury of the beast, who no doubt bore still in mind the dreaded whip, was instantly converted into fear. Conscious of having deserved punishment, it seemed desirous of concealing its bloody deeds, and skipped about the chamber in an agony of nervous agitation, throwing down and breaking furniture as it moved and dragging the bed from the bedstead. In conclusion, it seized first the corpse of the daughter and thrust it up the chimney as it was found, and then that of the old lady, which it immediately hurled through the window headlong. As the ape approached the casement with its mutilated burden, the sailor shrank aghast to the rod and rather 
gliding, then clambering down, it hurried at once home, dreading the consequences of the butchery, and gladly abandoning in his terror all solicitude about the fate of the orangutan. The words heard by the party. Upon the staircase were the Frenchmen's exclaiming, horror and affright, commingled with the fiendish jabberings of the brute. I have scarcely anything to add. The orangutan must have escaped from the chamber by the rod just before the breaking of the door. It must have closed the window as it passed through it. It was subsequently caught by the owner himself, who obtained it for a very large sum at Jardin de Plantes. Le Bon was instantly released upon our narration of the circumstances with some comments from Dupin at the bureau of the prefect of police. This functionary, however, well disposed to my friend, could not altogether conceal his chagrin at the turn which affairs had taken, and was fain to indulge in a sarcasm or two about the propriety of every person minding his own business. Let them talk, said Dupin, who had not the thought had not thought it necessary to reply. Let him discourse. It will ease his conscience. I am satisfied with having defeated him in his own castle. Nevertheless, that he failed in the solution of this mystery is by no means that matter for wonder which he supposes it, for in truth our friend the prefect is somewhat too cunning to be profound, and his wisdom is no stamen. It is all head and no body, like the pictures of Laverna are at best all head and shoulders, like a codfish. But he is a good creature after all. I like him especially for one master stroke of cant, by which he has attained his reputation for ingenuity. I mean the way he has dernier sequest at the expliquer sequé n'est pas to deny what exists and to explain what doesn't. And Well, it's just a story, but it, it, it does prove the importance of accepting input from someone who's not of the field, right? 